there. This is um, Diana McEwen. I am the Metro CERT Director, the Director of the uh, Metro Region of CERT and Energy Resource Team at the Great Plains Institute, one of our nonprofit partners. Uh, some folks know, but some folks are really frazzled by the structure of CERT because we're confusing, um, but we are not an organization. We're a partnership with a shared mission. There are five partners within the nonprofit, the university, and um, uh, government, including the Energy uh, Office of the State. And we essentially work to help communities identify, plan, and implement clean energy projects. We are a huge component of the Great Bed Cities outreach uh, statewide. And so uh, while we focus on clean energy, we do a lot of outreach more generally for this program. We've been there since the ground floor. Mm -hmm. um, so happy to have everyone here. Um, and I really want to thank our co-sponsors. Our series co-sponsor is Excel Energy. Thank you so much for sponsoring the series. And um, Transit for Little Communities and Mark Stone is in the room. Thank you so much for being here and supporting the Transit Workshop. Um, she's been working with us since day one on the transportation aspects and best practices for Transit cities. And we're very excited to um, go further and share best practices, ideas, lessons learned. Um, I think as we develop the agenda today, we discovered there's lots of opportunities because there's some things that are not really in the city realm, they're in the county realm, and there's some kind of collaboration opportunities. And so it just seemed like today was a better opportunity to talk about transit related to how you work with your county and what are they doing and how you interact in that way. So we're very, very happy um, to have that um, here today. And um, I think we're going to start off with Phil, but we like to do a little introduction around the room, and that's not going to work really well for people on the phone, right? Yeah. Oh, we have some. Can we hear through those little mics? No, they can't speak. <coughs> oh, so maybe we shouldn't do that. I feel like we shouldn't do that if they can't participate. Oh, maybe you can just tell us who's online. Yeah, I can. Patrick's going to tell us who's online, then we'll go around. Okay, so online right now. Um, I don't have where the people are from. Well, I guess some of their emails have. So Allison Grandos from the Three River Parks District, um, Andrew Hogg from City of Brooklyn Center, um, and a dealer from Marshall, um, Michelle Palm, who is the service coordinator, regional coordinator, and Will Mackman from Clay County. And we also will have we also have Patrick Halster on, and he's going to be presenting later. Perfect. And others might join us here in the room or online, but I um, just want to make sure we know. So let's just go around the room and say your name and um, your organization or city and your role there. Um, so, uh, yeah, Philip Music, uh, co-director of the Minnesota Green Tech Cities program, uh, working at the MPCA. Thanks, Rob. Good room. Good to see you again and at their environment portion. Uh, Caitlin Olson, I'm with the Minnesota Green Co-op Program, and I'm serving over at the MNITL for the Cool Congregations Program, so it's more of the energy carbon footprint, but everything's in common. I'm Mark Regal, I'm the Minnesota Green Corps member with the City of St. Paul Public Works Department, and I'm working on bicycle planning projects. And I'm Barb Sullivan, I'm the Director of Transit and Local Communities. I'm Barb Sullivan, I'm the Director of Transit for Local Communities. Hi, I'm DJ Forbes, and I work for Hennepin County and Public Works. I uh, work on active living issues. I'm Nadine Chalmers, also from Hennepin County, also doing active living and some bike ped work as well. Kate Quali, City of Fridley Environmental Planner, working on active transportation. I'm Danielle Cabot, I'm the Communications Great, that one worked. Uh, Terry Gibbs with the Alliance for Sustainability, and I'm on the uh, City of St. Louis Park Environment Sustainability Commission. Great. Well, thank you so much for all for being here. Oh, yeah. That's right. I'm Jeff Alger. I'm with the City of New Hope Community Development. No love for the City of New Hope. Sorry. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> and I'm Patrick Mavic, Minnesota Green Corps member with Great Plains Institute, helping with organizing the workshop and webinar today. I knew that everybody knew Patrick. I call him Patrick Great. Um, he is a great um, member from Green Corps with us. So um, without further ado, we're going to just jump in 
with the agenda. I believe um, what we thought made most sense was to start off with Philip kind of going over all of the transportation kind of best practices so people have a sense of what are the pieces in the Green Subsidies Program that relate to transit and transportation by TED. Um, and then we'll go from there on presentations and we'll have a good discussion. So Philip Music, take it away. All right, so if I speak like if I speak like this, is this going to work? No, maybe not. I shouldn't speak like this. All right. Here. Well, I actually wanted to um, take the opportunity to place transportation within a total context of the, of the Green Subsidies Program, the 28 Best Practices. So I, uh, some comments about that and then um, really focusing you know, on, on when we talk about transportation, we, ha we have to talk about land use. The transportation and land use, the two together, they're truly a chicken and egg, egg and uh, chicken question. Um, and throughout all that, I want to sort of emphasize sort of the human sort of element. I mean, we, I think it's, um, I mean, Green Step is an environmental sustainability program. It's easy for us to think about and focus on the sort of the technical sort of um, uh, you know, chemical natural resource pollution issues. But really, we're talking about we humans and how we live on the earth. So, um, so I want to sort of imbue my uh, comments and setting, and that really is a, a great setup for our um, uh, state Health Improvement Program uh, people, uh, Nadine and Jenny, working over at Hennepin County on uh, Bay Street. So that's the <clears throat> that's the sort of setup. So uh, and I don't have a slide for this, I, but you all are, are somewhat familiar so, with, with the 28 best practices. And um, the framework, or sort of our thinking as we were creating the program, looking around the country uh, uh, at other similar regional programs, such as with the Atlanta Regional Commission or state programs like Simple Jersey, we you know, we saw a lot of commonalities. And so our thinking was we sort of start with we create buildings on the landscape. So we have five best practices um, dealing with buildings. So new buildings, uh, renovating, preserving, uh, reusing buildings. We have two best practices about existing buildings. We have city buildings and then um, uh, private buildings. And then we put in sort of building lighting and also um, uh, street lighting because of sort of the technology issues. So we have five sort of buildings. We look on and, and what, where do we sort of use those buildings? We set them onto the land. So we have then five best practices around land use. So I'll go into those in more detail, but uh, we start out with actually the only Green Step best practice that focuses on planning because, as you know, Green Step is really about actions, what our cities doing and we help sort of want to promote and accelerate action in cities. But best practice number six is comprehensive planning. And comprehensive planning in cities is fundamentally about uh, creating a land use plan and a zoning map. Um, uh, we have two best practices dealing with sort of how we have, so the arrangement of buildings and density of buildings. Uh, so we have, and how cities grow. Um, uh, so we have mixed a mixed use best practice and a sort of city growth density best practice. Uh, we have sort of a best practice, that special case of auto oriented um, and sort of highway oriented uh, development. Uh, and then we have a conservation design uh, dealing with very sort of low density, how do we um, uh, preserve uh, large uh, sort of um, uh, ecosystems and set some buildings in place. Um, then we have all these buildings and we obviously don't just sit in at our laptops and uh, engage with each other through the internet, we move around. So we have transportation. We have four transportation best practices. Um, first one is the infrastructural one, complete green streets. Um, second one is more the sort of um, sort of how do we uh, reinforce and provide sort of uh, services and incentives and ways we can move around in different ways other than just the automobile. Uh, we have best practice around city fleet, so that's city operations best practice. And then we have a demand management transportation land use practice, which is looking at financial and sort of infrastructural sort of, uh, nudges for uh, how we can, in fact, more cost effectively, more environmentally, um, provide a range of options more than just the other bill. So we're moving around in this environment, and we create problems. And so we have nine best practices uh, in the environmental management uh, category of green subsidies. We have these best practices dealing with sort of the problems we create. So we have uh, best practices around uh, dealing with stormwater, which increases in our built environment, uh, 
dealing with wastewater, septic systems, drinking water, um, local air quality, uh, solid waste, um, uh, products that we that cities purchase, so issues of, of certain materials management, uh, product stewardship, uh, toxics. Um, let's see, we have the best practices around lakes. Um, I'm probably going to forget one of them, but so um, yeah, we don't, yeah, I didn't actually give you all of this, but this way we can sort of think, you know, mention about some of the goals. So environmental measure, and then and then what's the whole point of this? Well, we're sort of you know we're we're living in in our communities, and in Minnesota, a little more than 85 percent of people do live in a city, 855 cities across the across the state. So you know we're we're living and we're we're sort of doing things in community, and we're doing things in terms of economic productivity. So we have uh, five uh, community and economic best practices. Um, most fundamentally dealing with sort of the uh, sort of the metabolism of living. So that would be food, local food, calories, um, and energy, renewable energy. Um, really best practices that are looking back to how have people lived on the earth sustainably for thousands, tens of thousands of years, which is using renewable resources and growing local food. Uh, we have a best practice around community engagement because we are people engaging. Um, uh, and then we have two, uh, we operate productively, we have businesses, we have two best practices, uh, green business uh, best practice and then a sort of businesses, business energy best practice. So that's the, that's sort of the big frame of uh, green uh, cities and, and our thinking as we are creating and sort of looking uh, around it. What are Minnesota cities doing? What would be a framework that would help um, citizen commissions, city staff, uh, city leaders, uh, and city councils sort of accelerate sort of a move toward a more sustainable uh, communities. Jumping a little more closely then, um, I'll, I'll get to the slides in a minute quickly, but this sort of, as I said, this sort of egg and chicken, chicken and egg issue. So we have, you know, the point of the city is, is people mixing together and people move around. We still we still have this face-to-face -face engagement that cities historically are that sort of means that most people, um, at least currently, just to, I think I think we just passed that sort of half of the world's population live in cities in communities of size where, where you do have to think about how are you structuring, how are you facilitating um, and better sort of providing this face-to-face -face, uh, sort of engagement of people. So that's sort of the, the, the point of a city. And so if we're if we're meeting face-to-face, -face, then that means transportation. That means we need to that we need to get around. Um, but we have buildings in the way, right? So we have to, in our land use policies in cities, we have to sort of structure how how are we going to move? And are there those pesky little buildings in the way? Um, so we obviously so we so we obviously immediately we have to think about land use. And what we've done since since World War World War Two ended is that we have. We've optimized, we've maximized, we've perfected. We have done an astoundingly good job with enormous sums of money at moving cars. That has just been that sort of Eisenhower era sort of military industrial complex move cars in a super efficient way, and it has provided you know astounding mobility, economic opportunity. I mean, it's done a tremendous thing, and no one will doubt that. And we all appreciate cars. Um, but the reality is, on any given day, probably 40% of us, 40% of us, are don't have a car. We're too young. We're too old. We're too infirm. Access our licenses revoked. The cars in the shop. Many reasons why we don't have a car. And so, and so we're really what, what we're seeing is the emergence of kind of returning back to like how did we live 50, 100, 1,000 years ago? Well, we had we got around in different ways. And so, um, and, and, and I think I think partly this realization of how did we used to get around while well, there were the multiplicity or options in how we uh, how we transported ourselves. And I think this is partly in reaction to the sort of post-World War II uh, emphasis on cars has created the sort of problems that, uh, I mean, really ask anyone and anyone will point out aspects of how we've created communities that are unhealthy, dangerous, um, ugly, uh, fiscally unproductive from a city point of view. Property tax per acre is pretty low in a lot of cities, um, not something that's sustainable. Um, we have very unequitable cities. Um, 
where the ability to move from like the poor side of town across the freeway or the uh, railroad tracks or the industrial section um, to the part of town where you have services like a grocery store is, is difficult. Um, we've created very expensive uh, places, sterile, ugly. I mean, you know, the litany is not a problem. Um, we sort of know that. What we've done in, in, in Green Step in, um, and here's best practice number eight, at the bottom of all the best practices, as, as you know, we have a, a benefit section. And here's really where we put sort of the evidence base of sort of what is the evidence for what we're seeing in communities across the world, certainly across the United States, and certainly across Minnesota, which is what is the evidence for this emerging sort of, in a sense, return to um, transportation options and a land and land uses that support trans different uh, a range of transportation options. And so, in that sort of emerging and an evidence world, um, so we, we know the market is moving toward. Um, uh, well, no, maybe start with. Um, you know, we're seeing certainly in our young people, we're seeing um, dramatically lower rates of, of younger people getting licenses, getting licenses at a later age. Um, we're seeing uh, people, uh, households with fewer cars. Uh, we're seeing uh, households willing to buy smaller houses. We're seeing um, households willing to settle in denser areas. Um, um, we're seeing vehicle miles. I mean, the real evidence is we're seeing vehicle miles traveled in Minnesota and in the United States dropping despite increasing uh, a population. So there's a, there's a durable change here. And uh, we see it from what people are doing. We see it in the marketplace in terms of where uh, sort of those productive places that survived during the 2008 mortgage meltdown were center cities and denser areas and mixed use areas, areas that had uh, more than just car access. Um, uh, markets in terms of, um, again, property tax per acre in mixed use. Um, and mixed use parts of town did better from 2008 to 2012. So all this evidence is on is on green step, and it sort of points to this sort of emergence of what I would call this sort of sort of this transportation land use uh, uh, synthesis, and it it really aim, aims toward creating um, complete, compact, connected communities. And this is a, a phrase: complete, compact, connected communities. Four C's here, um, and it really comes from and, and was crystallized in a just a wonderful book. I think one of the best books in the last like 20 years. Um, um, called Sustainable Urban Urbanism by Doug Farr. Doug Farr is an architect, um, instrumental in the Architecture 2030 uh, movement. But probably more importantly, he was really the driver behind. Um, and this book is from about 20, probably 2009 or 8. But um, Doug Farr was sort of instrumental in creating the need for neighborhood development that certification system, uh, nationwide certification system, um, which pulls together at that uh, neighborhood uh, city scale, sort of how, how, how do we pull together all the elements, as Greenstack really tries, tries to do, how do we pull together elements that work together in a durable way? So complete, compact, connected communities. And you know, sort of heart and soul of that um, are sort of bike, ped, sort of transit, that infrastructure, uh, encouragement, incentives for again, moving around other than the car. Um, and complete streets are, are one sort of crucial sort of infrastructural and sort of mental sort of new tool um, that we're seeing at the state level with MnDOT adopting a complete streets policy and at the, at the city level um, sort of a tool for um, sort of building, uh, reinforcing complete compact and connected uh, communities. So just to sort of go through the slide. Oh, maybe one other thought. So, so so sustainable urbanism really was, I would say, built on two other sort of seminal books that really look at sort of how, how do we live on there in, in our communities? How, how do we build durable communities? How have durable communities been built in the past? And, and, and how do we preserve those ecosystem functions on the land? So, so the one I think back, and I, I forgot to bring them, um, the one is uh, Pattern Language by Christopher Alexander. And the pattern language is this. Sort of like a Bible. It's about this thick, this paper. It's fascinating bedtime reading because they're, they're really rules of thumb. There are about 250 rules of thumb, and you can you read the sort of the, the each one is is 
is structured, each pattern is structured like what's the problem, what's the evidence from around the world. So Alexander and his, his grad students, four, I think four of them, spent 10 years traveling the world, everywhere from um, you know, Mali to you know, Austria to you know, Savannah, Georgia. And they crystallized these, these patterns of living and sort of how do we care, how do we create communities that we love, that are durable, where businesses will survive and thrive, um, where people really take care of those lands. And so a pattern language has, uses sort of a transact approach where we start at the regional level and we boil all the way down to things like how do we design rooms and what materials do we use. So that was 1973, I think, pattern language. And then, and then before that was Ian McCard's like, Sign with Nature. So Christopher Alexander's book was really very much a psychological how do we live um, Ian McCart was really an ecological, um, again, both, but McCart did the smaller book, but Design with Nature was how do we fit our human settlement into nature such that nature can continue to, to provide those ecosystem services. So, um, so I think what we've seen in, in, um, in this vision of complete, compact, connected communities is building on the sort of intellectual sort of of Great, um, anyway, three great books. I forgot to bring the other two, but uh, so a little bit of a digression. Um, Can I ask a question? Yes. Can you say the four C's again? The four C's. So complete, compact, and connected communities. And so in green set we actually have so the the um, um, complete part is mixed uses. So we're looking at a range rather than Residences, single-family residences here, high-rises here, industry here, uh, schools here, schools here, <laughs> outside of town. Um, we're talking about mixing uses so that you don't need a car to, to do your daily activities. So that's the um, um, complete part. Um, the compact part is uh, going back to best practice number seven. I'm trying to go back to hmm. maybe you can go, okay you can go okay. okay so so this is the um, this is the compact part and this practice number this practice number seven we um, initially called sort of density and what we realized is that density is a very relative term and in a small community we have green stuff cities like Milan or 368 people. Um, <clears throat> density in, in Milan is very different than, than what you want in Milan. It's, if you add five or six dwelling units per acre, very different than downtown Minneapolis. We wouldn't want five or six dwelling units per acre in downtown Minneapolis. That would be rather fiscally unproductive, right? In Milan, it works. So, really, density is not the point of this best practice. The point of this pra best practice is as changes happen, as, we, as cities grow, develop, change, um, how will they do that? And so, best, so the best practice is about in, in select sort of zoning districts that make sense for the city, the culture of the city, the trajectory of the history of the city, um, how do we uh, increase the density um, uh, of uh, jobs and, and housing? Not across the board, because in many cities you want to have, again, this range. And so we know, especially in Minnesota, we're on the edge of the prairie, we, we know that there's a culture of wanting to have a little bit of space. Some people like that, and that's a housing option we want to provide. The evidence, however, the market evidence, is that, is that more people, and the demographic evidence, is that we have sort of overbuilt the sort of one house per acre model in Minnesota and, and nationwide, and we've really underbuilt. Uh, uh, the denser housing. So that's what this best practice is about. And then mixed uses, as I say, that's the um, um, complete part. And then the connected part is complete streets. So how do we uh, build, support, incentivize, make attractive uh, a network of street path transportation conveyances such that you're comfortable and happy to walk or a bike or a cane or a wheelchair or a truck or a bus or a train uh, rather than just, uh, just a car. Uh, let's see, so best practice number 
we're increasingly creating. Um, and then, and then uh, 14 here is, is really sort of uh, financial and infrastructural changes to, uh, again, sort of nudge um, us into creating, as, as we say at the top, sort of insert of a more walkable city. And by walkable, we mean you know, bikeable, uh, transit uh, friendly. Uh, and dealing, with, dealing with parking, again, not relevant for a lot of cities in Minnesota. I mean, parking policy, parking meters, parking prices are absolutely not an issue for many cities or in many parts of our Minnesota city, perhaps not an issue. But, um, you know, if you're talking about in, in Minneapolis, you're talking about uptown or downtown Minneapolis, um, parking policy is a huge, I won't say simple because it's politically complex, but it, we all respond to sort of financial incentives, and we have so so many wonderful incentives to make it easy to drive everywhere. That um, for some cities, if a city wants to fundamentally start to change those incentives and just just level the playing field and let the marketplace let the, let the feet kind of go where they will go, we we need to sort of change those incentives and parking policy is absolutely essential. And so we have some great resources. Uh, on parking policy, and actually Barb Foman did some of the early wonderful work with, um, there's no free park, what was the name of the real park, Barb? Um, the myth of free parking. The myth of free parking, a great, a great piece is which, which is out there, along with the EPA um, for parking policy um, white paper. Um, so, so that, that is my so much long-winded, thank you for uh, hearing the big picture, and so but what we really want to do is do something, so uh, we're going to hear from uh, Mindy and Cindy. Any burning questions for Bill? Anything clarifying? Is talking too fast or anything? Yeah. <laughs> and he's really thorough. Nice job. Ah, yeah. My colleague. My passion. From down the street. So um, I'm so, thank you, Bill. Um, we're excited to have um, Hennepin County. Um, I, kept hearing about all the amazing things that have been going on in Hennepin County. And so we're really excited to have um, the tag team of DJ and the Dean here today to talk about some of the work that they're doing in Hennepin County. And, and I think, again, like I said at the beginning, we're really trying to figure out, in a city, you have, there's some things you have total ownership of and some that you don't. And so with a lot of these kind of best practices, it's a collaboration with another local unit of government and sometimes with the county. And so here's a great example of an opportunity, um, and how many are Hennepin County cities in the room? One, two, three, four. So there's like almost half. Um, so that's helpful, but again, you know, whatever county you're in, um, so reach out to them about opportunities to work with them to plan for transit bike head. Um, and so this is just an example, um, and hopefully gives you an opportunity to uh, think about how you can work. And they'll, they'll highlight opportunities, uh, hopefully, that where cities can really engage um, in Hennepin County specifically, but then in other counties. Like, what's the best way for a city to kind of engage with the county on these issues? So, Anna, without further ado, turn it over to DJ and Nadine. Thank you. All right. This is working. Okay. So, I'm Nadine, and this is DJ, and we're here from Hennepin County. We're, we're representing Active Living Hennepin County, which is a partnership of cities around Hennepin County, as well as some agencies like MINDA and MDH. And we work on creating healthier communities, creating opportunities for healthy food, for community gardens. So the active living umbrella is growing. And we are expanding our focus to the city often. And we're funded by the SHIP program, which is the Statewide Health Improvement Program. And that funding comes from the State Health Department, the Minnesota Department of Health. And that allows Hennepin County to hire staff like DJ and myself who work on, among other things, we're able to provide assistance to cities in Hennepin County who are interested in complete streets and who need some technical assistance. So that is one of, one of our goals. So Bill and Diana, as does they come here to kind of talk about our work with complete streets around the county. Um, so as Nadine said, we are part of Active Living Hennepin County. And our primary role is working with the cities and townships throughout Hennepin County on adopting complete streets resolution, uh, complete streets policies, as it relates to complete streets issues. That we also have a number of other um, things going on in our wheelhouse. Hennepin County.
County itself has a complete streets policy. Uh, it was passed by it was passed in 2009, and then in 2012, 2013, the Hennepin County Complete Streets Task Force was created, in which members from multiple departments kind of got together and said, "All right, we have this policy. How are we actually going to implement this on the ground?" And as a result of that. Um, a lot of mechanisms were installed in the transportation department of how they look at road reconstruction projects differently than they did in the past. Um, Nadine and I uh, have relationships with the transportation department, but our primary work around Complete Streets is working with local cities and local partners on how we can help them, how we can be most affecting, um, effective in helping them achieve their goals. So, on this slide, I just have a couple of pictures of different complete streets, and I think this is a really important point. Um, there is no silver bullet for complete streets. There is no one size fits all. Um, it's really, as Phil said, it, it's really a relationship between land use and transportation. And so, a complete street in a rural area is going to look very different than a complete street in a very dense urban area. Um, so, I thought this picture highlighted that well, and. Something also that's very important about complete streets is that it's very context sensitive. So it's dependent upon your community. It's dependent about your community wants. It's dependent about the practices that your community wants to implement. And so there are a lot of different ways of having complete streets. Um, sorry for the folks um, remotely, but uh, I did pass out a sheet that has some resources, and so I just wanted to kind of read what complete streets is. So as um, Um, as defined by Hennepin County, and then there's also a definition that the uh, Minnesota State Legislature created in 2008, but roadways that are planned, designed, operated, and maintained to enable safe, convenient, and comfortable travel for all users and abilities regardless of their mode of transportation, whether that's walking, biking, driving, or riding public transportation. And I think there are really two parts of that that really kind of stand out to me and, uh, and are important. Planned, designed, operated, and maintained. This is a very holistic policy. It's not just looking at the design and then we forget about the street. It's looking about looking at the street in a more comprehensive manner. Um, so we're here because Princess Cities asked us to, and the the complete streets element of Princess Cities more focuses on complete streets that affect environmental sustainability, stormwater issues, otherwise known as living streets. Um, Living streets is a very, I would say, it's a more comprehensive policy than complete streets. It's, it's addressing everything that complete streets is, but also looking at it through an environmental lens. Um, so it, it's incorporating green infrastructure into your roadway, thinking, you know, thinking about that urban heat island effect. If you're in an urban place, thinking about stormwater runoff. Um, so complete streets, it's really about changing your expectations of the transportation system. Uh, Phil talked about this a little bit, but post-World War II, it was all about accommodating automobile traffic efficiently. How do we move as many cars through a certain area as quick as possible and get as many people on the road? We are starting to realize that this isn't a sustainable mode, and there are other people than automobiles and, and, and drivers, so we're really starting to beginning, we're beginning to think about all users and kind of be looking at transportation as one of our largest types of public space. How do we make, how do we want this public realm to function? Do we want it to be a pass-through for people, or do we want it to be a place where all people can um, live and, and drive, bike, take transit, etc.? Um, so I kind of have done this before, but one really important thing about complete streets is obviously process, process, process. One size not fit all, there's no silver bullet. Um, it's also a very broad policy where it affects environmental issues, as Nadine said, we're funded through public health grants. Uh, Complete Streets is a policy that affects public health. You get more people out walking and biking, you reduce types of chronic diseases, you reduce air emissions, it's very comprehensive and it's a broad policy, um, both its goals and the way it can support other policies. There we go. I just, like, I just wanted to put this on the screen. Um, this is just a typical cross section of a roadway project. Uh, it's taken from the internet. There's nothing special about this, but just it's just showing what you know what a roadway project during the design looks like. There are 66 feet of right of way. Thinking about complete streets is taking a step back and saying, what do we want to do with these 66 feet? Traditionally, 
roads were designed from the center line out, where you did level of service, how many vehicles do we want to travel during this area, let's design it to that. Complete the Streets is really kind of flipping that on its end and thinking about its most vulnerable users first from the outside in, focusing on sidewalks where pedestrians walk, live, and exist, going in one more level to the clubs, and then your and then your vehicular traffic. Um, so there are a lot of different ways to find the 66 feet, and that's when you talk to your community members, you start analyzing statistics, not only vehicular, but pedestrian and bicycles, and then you come up with an area or a way to design a road that really addresses all the users. Um, uh, just a quick plug, uh, NINDOT and the University of Minnesota Center for Transportation Studies host a Complete Streets workshop, I think typically once a year. Uh, it's a really, I would highly recommend it to any practitioners out there. It's uh, very useful to think about roadway design and operation and maintenance from a, a, a non-traditional you and how to really incorporate complete streets into your process. So we included this slide because I think that complete streets has this bad reputation that it's going to force cities to include all modes on all roads. When complete streets is really more about how you think about the road and how you think about planning for the reconstruction of the road or the repaving or the and overlay. And we included this picture because if children are happy and safe playing in the street, then this is a complete street. You don't need to put a protected bike lane on a quiet cul-de-sac. So complete streets is not about forcing cities to do things or about um, you know, putting bike lanes and really wide sidewalks everywhere. It's just about when you go to repave the street or redo it, you have to think about all of the users. And if you Think about it as you go through the process and you realize that you know, sidewalks aren't necessary or bike lanes aren't necessary, then you don't need to solve them. Can I ask a really good question? Sure. This is Diana. So I don't I do clean energy, not transit, so people keep saying this phrase mill and overlay. I don't know what that means. Oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 it's okay, because I'm sure everybody else in this whole room knows, but I don't. So it's just for me. No, that's a really good question. Mill and overlay is when you take like the top couple of inches off of a road and then you grind it up and then you just lay it back down. So it's what cities do in between major reconstruction. The major reconstructions only happen every like, you know, maybe every 50 years. So that's when the road's all gravelly like for yeah. a while. Yeah, yeah. But it's kind of it, it extends the life of a road by five, ten years. So and you don't have to redo the curves or anything. It's a lot less expensive. But Hennepin County is looking at mill and overlays more and more as an opportunity to make small changes. Like you need to repaint the road. So when we're doing a mill and overlay, is there a chance to, at that point, put down a bike lane so we don't have to wait 50 years to review the curve? Quick question. Sure. For mill and overlay, so we wanted to know more in advance when they're going to happen so cities can deem to be more proactive. Is there a way that head of the county can, whatever, have a website or somewhere that people can see up several years in advance? That's a really good question, and we are actively working on that. We've had that problem internally. Um, we have been trying very hard just to get, you know, because our transportation department is out of Medina, so sometimes we're downtown in Minneapolis to try to communicate. But that is a top, top priority of us, of ours, and we're, we're working to get it, like, specifically to the information to the cities, but also that information out more generally to the public. So within the next couple of years, definitely. Can I just say how funny it is that um, there's trouble communicating between Edina and South Minneapolis? Just like, but, uh, oh, I think it's Edina. I was like, that's funny. No. No. I was going to no, it's not that far. Right? It's only like 30 miles. Right. Got it. Thank you. So there are many different approaches that uh, cities and communities can take to incorporating complete streets, support living streets into your community. And I just kind of wanted to go down the Again, that's real quick here. Um, a lot of these policies, resolutions, plans, design guidelines can be driven from a number of different parties, whether it's driven from a staff perspective that you know, we need to really start thinking about our processes more, um, more holistically. It can be driven from an elected official's uh, perspective of whether they heard from their community that you know, the city, the town is not um, building the public ground that they desire, or it can really be driven from an ad, ad, ad 
advisory community, you have a bicycle advisory community, you have, you have engaged citizens that want to make change. And so all of these can be kind of driven from a couple of different perspectives. Um, so kind of starting from the least comprehensive to the most, um, city resolution. I think most of you know what these are, but um, this is a non-binding official statement of support for a corruption community transportation project as a way to improve access, public health, and quality of life. This is a really good starting point, although, as I said, it's non-binding, and a lot of cities can have a resolution and kind of point to it and say, hey, we have a, we have a complete street resolution. Whether they do anything with that or not is really up to them. Um, so while Hennepin County believes that this is a good starting point, we really push cities to kind of start with a policy. And a policy, complete streets policy, is really you know an official city policy. It's typically developed for an internal group of stakeholders, which is representatives from planning, engineering, public works, economic development, elected officials, et cetera. But it really kind of gets into the processes of when the city is doing their mill and overlays, when they're doing their uh, CIP work, uh, capital improvement projects that they are thinking about their reconstruction processes a little bit more holistically. Kind of continuing down um, the level of comprehension, an implementation plan takes it policy a couple steps further and really starts to think about timelines, mapping priorities of certain streets over others, and really trying to focus on where, where can we accommodate the most vulnerable users first, what are our priorities, how are we actually going to put what we say into action. Um, and then the design guidelines. And this is kind of the holy grail of complete streets. Um, I just coined that, so don't know. So. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, it, it, it's getting into when you're doing your um, road uh, street reconstruction project, depending on the context and the land use surrounding, what is kind of the baseline for complete streets. And it, and it, and it allows um, engineers and planners to point back to these guidelines. It makes the process more transparent. So when a community member goes, why did we create a road in a certain way? There are these design guidelines um, that either a city, a county, or a state can come up with, or you can point to a uh, national um, kind of official kind of design <laughs> guidelines that, that, uh, that address complete streets. Um, NACSO is a very, very good one. Um, National Association of City Transportation Officials. Thank you. Um, so those are a number of different approaches to complete streets, and kind of the end goal is to, to have something as, as comprehensive as possible while allowing cities flexibility. Um, but that that is kind of different, kind of different starting point. Yep. Yep. So maybe, yeah, maybe um, maybe I should just add that uh, DJ and Nadine and I are are talking about some. A refinement, improvement of the best practice uh, action around adopt a complete street. If they resolution. So I think this this um, this sort of hierarchy of resolution policy plan and design guidelines is um, we're going to work that into the uh, and modify the best practice over the next I don't know, month or two when we get around to it. So do you think so that would be like the different stars then for that policy? I think that yeah. yeah. I, I know that you guys have sent me uh, yeah. some language on that. So. Probably, yeah. So, so like a three-star um, uh, completion of the best practice around these streets would be a create, adopt, and having guidelines. That's the holy grail. I like that because, because, you know, street design guidelines, that's what you give, you know, it's public works people. And it's like, okay, that's the Bible. They do it. So I've had questions from cities in Hennepin County um, that struggle with the complete street best practice. Um, because we get step three, that is something that they need to do. And um, they were curious that they adopt the Hennepin County complete streets, is that good enough? Or if they adopt the Hennepin County and tweak it, um, what things, I mean, can they tweak it so that it's not no longer applicable to what we're looking for to best practice? I mean, I just get, get this question a lot because the county has one. So what the rules are, and I'm looking at Phil because he's the one that decides. He's the decider, so. Oh, uh, what did you guys do? Sure. We actually <coughs> encourage cities to take, you know, plagiarize complete street policies from other cities or counties. Because why would you spend hours and hours writing a policy if there's a template out there that you can tweak that will work well for your city? So we definitely encourage that. And Hennepin uh, County's complete street policy 
is fairly comprehensive. So, and you know, New Hope has a good one, Brooklyn Center has a good one. We'll go through some examples later. But we do encourage cities to take those good comprehensive policies to make them work for their own city. So this is a map of Henson County. And these are the cities in Henson County that have complete streets resolutions, complete streets policies, and living street policies. It's a little bit hard to read, but you can see Edina in the sort of lightest green um, has a living street policy, which goes beyond, again, goes beyond complete streets to really consider stormwater, street trees, um, a lot of environmental concerns. The, the green is complete streets policies, and the yellow is complete streets resolutions. And Minneapolis is in the process of developing their complete streets policy. So, so St. Louis Park here? Pardon? Oh, St. Louis Park has a resolution. Okay. Oh, yes. And right now we are talking with Eden Ferry, who is thinking about a living street policy. And we're also talking with Crystal. And this is sort of, so Edina went and did their living street policy on their own. They were very gung-ho. They had this wonderful policy um, with an implementation plan as well. And that was not something that Hennepin County had really thought about. We didn't really think about living streets. We thought mostly about complete streets. But then this year, when we've been talking to Eden Prairie and Crystal, we found that the political climate in those cities are more open to talking about environmental issues than they are to talking about bicycle and pedestrian issues. And to us, you know, it's about the whole system. So whether you want to think about it from the environmental benefits, reduce air pollution, improved aesthetic, you know, improved aesthetics on streets, more street trees, less runoff, that's great. It, it also um, positively influences pedestrians and bicyclists. So we're working now with uh, Eden Prairie and Crystal to design living street policies. And we really encourage cities to find, so that's kind of an example of how cities have to find the angle that works best for them and, and run with it. Because that you need to you need to have a policy that your city council will be behind and that your residents will agree with and that your staff will support. Which sounds sounds really hard, but cities have been really creative in finding ways to frame the policy so that they support the existing city goals. I just kind of wanted to wrap up. Um, I guess we have four more slides. But just kind of want to talk about the lessons that we've learned um, in our time working with cities. Um, so one of the things that we've kind of run up against, and you did mention this previously, is what does a complete streets policy require? And I think there's some confusion around complete streets um, where a number of folks believe that it is the all modes for all roads always. And there's, there's pushback against that because if you're you know, a local collector has a off, off street trail next to it. It probably doesn't make sense to put bike lanes in a certain context. In some, if any. But so there's there's been a little bit of pushback against. Well, if we adopt a complete street policy, does this hamstring our engineering staff into you know, expanding the scope of every project? So that's something that we kind of run into, and just really want to emphasize whenever we talk to um, folks about complete streets that it's very, very context sensitive, and it does not mean all modes for all roads, but it's really dependent on the community's character and the tie between land use and your transportation goals. Um, the philosophy and processes, it's, I don't know if complete streets is a philosophy, but it is a holistic way of looking at the mechanism of how a city, county, or state creates the transportation system and how they create the trans transportation system focusing not solely on the automobiles, but focusing on all users, because we all are pedestrians, even before we get in our cars, um, focusing on bicyclists, and focusing on folks that use transit. Um, like Nadine said, these kind of policies affect public health, they affect environmental um, sustainability. It's a very broad policy, and it, it's kind of taken these processes that were ingrained in our city building for so long and flipping them on their head. Um, kind of framing, and I kind of just discussed this, but just the broader benefits of a complete street, of a living street. They affect a lot of things, and, and Phil alluded to this. The 
alluded to this a lot in his in his speech, but there is this integral tie between land use and transportation. And complete streets is a mechanism that can be used to support city's goals. It can be used as a mechanism to advance city goals, but it's something that a city, a county, a state can point back to and use as support when they're going through a project. When they're going through a process, they point to policy and say, this is why are we doing this in this certain way. Um, local champions. You need a local champion, whether that's a staff member, an elected official, an advocacy group. You need someone that is willing to push this through the city and make it a priority. Um, it's not enough for folks like me and Nadine to come and say, hey, you guys should adopt a complete street policy. And then, well, why is the county coming in and telling us to do stuff? So you need it to be um, community context, and you need to have it being driven from a community level. Quick question on that. Yeah. Um, the Ramsey County Act of Living does support the citizen groups that are working on these things. And so far, as far as I can tell, like the bike coalitions in Bloomington and Edina, um, they don't really have any official way of getting together. Have you guys thought about maybe, um, like St. Louis Park might like to get a bike type group, they don't really have one yet. Would, would you be open to hosting a gathering with the citizen bike type groups in? Uh, yeah, hold on. Well, let's maybe. Yeah. So working directly with community members is a little bit new for Active Living in Kentucky. Um, and we're doing, this year, currently, we're doing a pilot project in Brooklyn Center and Hopkins, in which we actually got a steering committee together, which does include bicycle and pedestrian advocates. And the goal of that project is to bring community leaders together to talk about these issues. So. That's a really good point, and we're definitely thinking about how we can work, how we can better um, partner with community groups because, like DJ said, we can't we can't force it into the community, uh, but these community groups can be amazing advocates for this work. We would be happy to help host lots of that, and Quality Bike is also open to doing that too. Great, that's great to know. Oh, yeah, let me let's talk afterwards. That's a great idea. Um, as I was saying, it's a collaborative process. Uh, through different internal staff, through the community, through the elected officials, but um, getting the task force together and uh, having those conversations before anything comes to city council or to you know, a planning commission is very, very important. Um, and then I just wanted to point out the National Complete, Complete Streets Coalition is an amazing resource. They are housed in Smart Growth America. Uh, if you go to their website, we uh, did have a printout that we passed out to the group here. We can have Patrick email that to everyone that's on the, the webinar. But they, they're great. Um, we use them a lot when, you know, when forming our arguments, and they have great uh, PowerPoints on how to talk to a city council about these issues. What are the cost issues? What are the cost benefits? How do you do this in the wintertime? So they just have a really great comprehensive website on pretty much anything you can imagine about complete streets. So I would just want to point that out and have folks visit that. Um, All right, just to wrap up stuff together today, um, again, as we already talked about this, complete streets are unique to each city. Each city will need to find strategy that works for them in order to pass the policy and to implement the state. We really encourage cities to think about how they can partner with other agencies to make this happen. Talk to your local public health agency. Even, you know, sometimes, like, like uh, Hennepin County can. Sometimes your local public health can actually provide funding for this to happen. But other times they can just provide, they can provide staff time, they can provide enthusiasm, moral support. You know, if you feel like you don't have support within your own um, department, I encourage you to look to public health for support for things like complete streets. The watershed, watershed districts are also a great resource. The city of Maplewood, their watershed district funded a complete street, uh, a living street policy and implementation plan. They actually had a consultant to it. It's very long and it includes design guidelines. It's an amazing policy. So if you can reach out to your watershed district and get that funded, that would save you time and it's likely to be an extremely high quality project. Another resource that's not on the slide is to reach out to your RDC, your Regional Development Commission, um, if your city falls into one because they of expertise in this area as well. And the last piece of advice is to connect with your peer cities. If you, you know, there are a lot of 
cities around, uh, around Hennepin County and around Minnesota who have high quality complete streets policies, and they probably ran into the same problems that you're anticipating in your city. So if you contact us, if you contact, we, we know um, it's Amber Dahlman and Matthew Jadal at the Minnesota Department of Health who we can put you in contact with. They know which cities have complete streets policies, they have a pretty good idea of what kinds of problems they ran into, and it could be really helpful for you to talk to your peer city to help you work through some of those real or anticipated problems. And uh, I just want to say it's um, related to connect with peer cities. On the website, um, when you're on that best practice, you can go to the tab that says who's doing this. You click on it and you can see which cities you're doing it. You can call your bestie in whichever city that you see on that list and ask them questions and such. And so we, we try to make that website as user-friendly as possible so you can find resources that are other cities we know that that's probably the best advice you can get um, to city. So that's all that we came to say. We're happy to answer any other questions. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. I want to um, stop, even though we did questions throughout. I want to stop and see if we have time. We do have time for questions. Oh, we have one more. Oh, oh, oh. oh. Okay, now, class. <laughs> um, so we'll do questions. Terry. Yeah, Terry Gibbs. Um, I was wondering if you could share just about the distinctions. Bill talked about green complete streets, uh, using that term, living streets and complete streets. Um, as, as far as, do you think people are confused at all about the differences between those? And I was wondering if there's competition, like are complete streets people threatened by living streets and you know, are they moving towards living streets or going to get rid of the term complete streets? I mean, just I was just wondering what, sort of where we are and if green streets is a term being used by others now to incorporate that. So I was just wondering if you could share about that. Sure. Well, if you Google complete streets, thousands of things come up. There's a lot of research and a lot of literature on complete streets. If you Google living streets, you come up with Maplewood, Medina, and just, you know, there's a Los Angeles design guidelines, so there's a lot less literature out there right now about living streets. I would say that complete streets is not at all threatened by living streets. I don't know if anyone argued you disagree. <laughs> no, okay. Um, because living streets really encompasses all the things that complete streets encompasses. And if, you know, people who support um, alternative modes of transportation are generally happy if the city also wants to put in trees and address stormwater issues. So I would say there's some competition. Yeah, and I'll say for kind of clarification, a um, term that's used on the green stuff cities is complete green street, which I would say is equal to living street. Um, to complicate things even further, uh, you know, complete street doesn't impact the, uh, and, and I mean it does, but not not a directly kind of written. So living streets is the same as complete green streets. Is, is one, when people are referring to it, are they is, are they moving towards calling it living streets? Are they calling it green living streets? Or I, I just was, I just kept knowing. To be honest, I'm not sure. Uh, personally, I feel like living streets is a little clear just because it's a different word and you're not using complete green streets. But um, I can't really speak to which uh, is being used predominantly. So I hate to say it, but I don't think complete green streets is really, it's not really a term. <laughs> um, so we might be working with both to change the terminology just to be clear about um, what the requirements are. So usually people talk about complete streets or they talk about living streets. And those are really the two the two umbrellas that, that we talk about. Yeah, I think that's where we're moving. When we, um, this would be 2009, when we, Let's see, the best practice in 2009, the best practice was complete streets. I think quickly, within a year, we realized, wait a minute, where's, where's the green? So we just, because green streets does have a literature, you know, the left hand just would be one example. But I think because we have, uh, first of all, our district working with Maple Wood, well, and North, yeah, North Bay Park. I think living streets, the term for Minnesota, I think living streets is the term. So I think we're going to change the, um, you know, the duty green step, we can sort of, so I think we're going to change the best practices to 
completed streets. Um, and, and I would say in terms of completed streets kind of versus living streets, I think the only issue is the perceptive one in, in um, when MinDOT was, MinDOT was looking at its complete street, complete street policy, initially, I think at the beginning of that, that process, uh, MinDOT people thought of trees and you know, softening of uh, street edges as kind of, um, um, what do they call it? Uh, amendments, no, um, amenities, there we go, amenities. As if the whole point of living walking, transporting yourself is all about getting there as opposed to living. So, and, and as a, as a, so, so the term amenity sort of places trees, which we know, you know we're biophilic people. We, we, we gravitate towards something other than concrete. Um, so I think moving, uh, perceptually moving away from um, uh, trees as amenities to sort of part and parcel of conclusions, I think it's, it, we're just all evolving and learning. So, so I think the short answer is we'll change the I think we'll use the term living, living streets. Can you talk a little bit about how the complete street policies address county roads and how Hennepin County is involved from a complete street perspective with the site reconstruction project? And the insightful question comes from China. <laughs> we get this one a lot. Um, so, as DJ said, and the county has had a complete street policy since 2009. And what Hennepin County has is a checklist, so that's our form of implementation plan. So engineers, whenever they're working on a transportation project, they have to go through this checklist and say, yes, I did consider pedestrians. Yes, we did think about widening the sidewalk. And that is, so that's really the major implementation tool that we as a county have used. I will not deny that we haven't always implemented the best, most complete street. And that is something that the county is working on internally all the time. <laughs> it's made, you know, it's one of the biggest challenges that we face because county roads have to move a lot of traffic. So we have to weigh our commitment to complete streets with the engineers' commitment to making sure that congestion is minimized and making sure that we can move the amount of traffic that we can. Did you have a question about any, did you have something in mind? Oh, um, I mean, nothing, nothing specific, no. Yeah, just, I just, I mean, I want to acknowledge that it's something we struggle with and that, you know, many cities and counties, you have this policy, it doesn't mean that everything is going to be so swimmingly and just automatically, you know, you're going to always have this perfect complete street. So, we, it's a constant struggle and it, it's a change. It's a change from what our planners and engineers have been told to do for the past 50 years. So now that now that we're asking them to think more holistically about the road, it's taking some time, time for Hennepin County to sort of turn the machine around and to make sure that we're implementing complete streets in the best way. Two more questions. Let's go Kay, then Barb, then uh, Mary. Well, just, just really a comment about um, the county and engineering aspects of things um, with your statement about the checklist, which I presume is available to all of us. Yes, online. Um, have you considered pedestrians? The other thing I, I think about is whose time is the most valuable regarding Philip's remark about congestion? Because right now it's presumed that the occupant of a car's time is the most valuable. Mm -hmm. And is that really the way to look at it? You know, how much more congestion is acceptable to implement policies that help with pedestrians and bicycles. That's a really good point. And it also it also brings up the fact that complete streets is not just about street design, it's about how long you make those pedestrian crossings and how frequently they come and how you design the signals along a road. And I think our engineers' perception of whose time is most valuable and what is an acceptable level of track of car congestion is changing and it's something that we're working with them to to understand. I think that's a great point, and I think um, it, it, it should be thought about more thoroughly, but um, how, our, it's, well, you know, how our roads are designed, they're focused on level of service, primarily on the vehicular point of view. It doesn't focus on the level of service for pedestrian bicycles. The city of Charlotte, they have a very, Charlotte, North Carolina, has a very um, comprehensive complete street policy and 
implementation plan, and they did a lot of upfront data analysis. And when they were redesigned, they kind of changed how they redesigned their roads, and they started looking at level of service for pedestrians and bicyclists, and really started implementing pedestrian and bicycle counts into um, their analysis of the street. And I think that would be a very logical next step for how public spaces, particular transportation systems, are designed. Because I mean, you hit the nail right on the head. Why is congestion the only thing we're measuring? And I think we should be measuring other things. So, but the, uh, the city of Charlotte, North Carolina, has some really interesting things. The city of Boulder, Colorado, has as well in terms of uh, actually looking into the data of other modes. And just quick before our next question, anybody in the webinar, you have um, in your menu, webinar menu, there's a chat function. If you have any questions, please type your questions in there and I'll ask them for you. Right. Um, I just wondered what the county's um, current cost participation policy is on um, county roads when um, the city and the county decide that they want to have a trail or a wider sidewalk for pedestrian scale lighting or street trees or benches or what have you. Who has to pay for those? Does the county pay or do municipalities have to pay? Great question, Barb. Um, right now we have two different cost participation policies for trails and sidewalks. And maybe you just correct me if I'm wrong. But I believe the trail cost participation is 50-50 where the county will pay 50% and that the city will have to match the additional 50. Right now our sidewalk participation policy is 25%, 75%, so the county will pay 25% and the city will pay 75%. That is something that we are analyzing internally and coming from the active living perspective, it should at least be 50-50 if not more. Like I said, that is an internal conversation that's happening throughout Hennepin County, but it is being um, is being thought about. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could just uh, share how resistant engineers are to it in general, and also who are there are there opponents um, of this. You know, and how strong is their opposition? Like American Automobile Association, do they weigh in on this at all? And like, do car manufacturers weigh in on this at all? It's just curious. Good question. Really interesting question in terms of kind of the car manufacturing at a larger scale. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know to be honest whether there is a lobbying group kind of pushing against complete streets. I don't want to speak for all engineers because I think we are all um, different folks, different strokes. But I think it's just um, looking at it a little bit more holistically and instead of going through the traditional checklist that was maybe implemented in the street design previously, I think it's just kind of kind of flipping that on its head. Uh, I think some are against it at first at first view. It's you know, it's you're just changing your plowing uh, standards in terms of winter with, with different um, with different uh, width of right away. It's, it's changing, you know, your typical construction processes, but I think, um, and I'm not an engineer, so I don't want to speak for all engineers, but I think uh, it's something that people can adapt to. I think with all change, people kind of push back against it at first, but um, I don't know, there's been, there's been some some engineers that have been on board, you guys right here, um, and uh, there are some that have probably pushed back, it, pushed back against it a little further. So from my personal experience, I would say that I expect the engineers to push back really hard, but I found that when I go to actually talk to them one on one, they have very real concerns, and they are responsible for actually solving all the problems. So sometimes in planning, we can say, "We want sidewalks, we want trees, we want all these things," but then the engineer is the one that says, "I only have 60 feet of right of way. Like I literally can't do all of these things." So we found that back and forth conversations and Lending, you know, trying to help them work through the problems as opposed to blaming them when things don't look as pretty as you wanted has been really effective. And I've been, you know, constantly pleasantly surprised at how willing our staff are to work back and forth and to try to, you know, achieve mutual goals. We need to get moving on to the next presentation. We should have time at the end for more questions. So, yeah. So we'll move on to the next presentation. Yeah. So our 
be switching over to Patrick Hollister. Um, he's he's presenting by webinar from Battle Lake. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Okay. Can you, can you see my screen? Not yet. I'm switching it over now. Okay. Okay, you should be able to accept. Yep, I did. Okay, we can see you. Okay, cool. Uh, hang on here a sec. Okay, everybody should be able to see the Partnership for Health Triangle. So, yep. okay, terrific. I'm uh, Patrick Hollister with Partnership for Health. We are the statewide health improvement program for Becker, Clay, Ottertail, and Wilkin counties. Uh, and I am speaking to you live from exam room two in Ottertail County Public Health in Fergus Falls, Minnesota. So, um, so we want to. I want to talk about the Highway 78 Complete Streets project in Battle Lake, Minnesota. Uh, our friends from Hennepin County gave us an excellent overview of what Complete Streets are. Uh, so I'm going to skip these slides, but I understand that this webinar is being recorded and will be available online afterwards. And so if somebody wants to read this text, uh, they're welcome to do that later. Um, and there, there was a reference made to the National Complete Streets Coalition. I believe that is now part of Smart Growth America. It still exists, but it's under the umbrella of Smart Growth America. So you might want to search uh, online for Smart Growth America. Uh, these are bullet points for elements of a complete, complete streets policy. Again, I'll skip over this, but somebody can uh, look it over again later. Just give a couple seconds here of it on the screen here for somebody that wants to replay it. This is a list of uh, cities and counties and, uh, in some cases, metropolitan governments in Minnesota that have complete streets policies or resolutions. I cannot guarantee that this is an up-to-the-minute list, uh, but the communities that are bolded on this list are communities in my four-county area, and I'm proud to say that I had a hand in every one of the bolded ones, except for Fargo-Moorhead Metropolitan Council of Governments. They adopted theirs before I got to them, but it's an excellent uh, policy. Battle Lake, with 800, 875 people, adopted a Complete Streets policy in 2011. Uh, back when the National Complete Streets Coalition was a separate organization, uh, and I don't know if they continue to do this or not, but they used to, every February, uh, produce a report on all Complete Streets policies adopted in the previous year. And so we adopted ours in 2011, and when the uh, report came out in early 2012, uh, we were delighted to see that we made their top five list. In other words, uh, we were among their five favorite municipal complete streets policies adopted in 2011. Here is a uh, photo of downtown Battle Lake at the beginning of the automobile invasion. Uh, those who know more about classic cars than I do have estimated the date of this photo to be around 1917-1918. Here is a much more recent photo of downtown Battle Lake. This was taken last year. This is our before photo. Uh, later on in the presentation, I'll show you the after photo. Uh, but this was taken by Jeremiah Morkey, who's the communications guy for MnDOT District 4 based in Detroit Lakes. He got up in a bucket truck and took this photo. Uh, one of the phrases or terms that is commonly associated with complete streets is road diet. Uh, we have overbuilt capacity on many of our roads over the last 60 years. We have built more lanes than we need, and we have, in many cases, made those lanes wider than they need to be. So what a lot of communities are doing now is they're shrinking either the number of lanes or the width of those lanes within the same right-of-way. And what that does is leave them room on the sides to make the sidewalks wider or add bike lanes or do other things. Uh, this is a textbook example of probably the most common form of road diet. This is what's known as a four to three conversion. On the left are four lanes, uh, two lanes in each direction. On the right are three lanes, one lane in each direction with a center turn lane. Uh, and I don't know what town this is, but wherever this is, 
uh, when they did the four to three conversion. They gave themselves extra room on the sides. You can see that they added bike lanes. Uh, they don't seem to have widened the sidewalks. So I think primarily what they did in this case was restriping. Um, there was a reference earlier to NACTO. Um, there are two national design uh, guidebooks that your engineers uh, follow. One is NACTO and the other one is ASHTO, otherwise known as the ASHTO Green Book. Um, the national design guidebooks uh, tend to be more conservative than they need to be because uh, they're cautious about things. The national design guidebooks generally recommend uh, a 4 to 3 conversion at 15,000 or less ADT, average daily trips. Um, although there are engineers out there that think that's too conservative and they are willing to do a 4 to 3 conversion for as high as 18,000 ADT or even 22,000 ADT. The Battle Lake story actually begins in Alexandria because uh, Battle Lake was inspired to do what we did because of what Alexandria did. Um, I started with Partnership for Health in February of 2010 and in 2010 uh, even though Alexandria is not part of my territory, I became aware of a series of public meetings about a complete streets project on Broadway Avenue, uh, which is the main street in, uh, in Alexandria. And on the upper right is a flyer from the first of the three public meetings. I went to the first two of the meetings. I wasn't able to go to the, go to the third one. But they talked about a lot of different concept designs for how to do a complete streets project on Broadway Avenue. And I thought, this is so cool. Um, I want to find a community somewhere in my four counties where I can do something like this. And Battle Lake gave me that chance. So I was presenting about the um, Alexandria meetings. Uh, and somebody from Battle Lake heard me talk about it. And they invited me to come speak to the Battle Lake City Council about complete streets and also about the possibility of upgrading what was planned to be a mere resurfacing of Highway 78 through Battle Lake in 2013 into a uh, reconstruction and complete streets project. So I spoke to the Battle Lake City Council on June 14, 2011 about adopting a complete streets policy and also about forming a task force uh, or some sort of citizen group to come up with a concept plan for a complete streets project on Highway 78 uh, that the city would then formally submit to MnDOT District 4 and say, here, District 4, this is what we want you to do on Highway 78 in 2013, not just the resurfacing. And that very evening, uh, the city council adopted a complete streets policy, and they also uh, voted to form that task force. They put me on the task force, which was great. Uh, and going around the table here, um, these are other people on the task force. Uh, the guy who, who's uh, the back of his head, you can see, uh, looking at the computer, that's Dan Malmstrom. Uh, and then to his left is Wanda, the city clerk. And then to her left is Jeremy, the city engineer. And then in the back there is Reba Gilliand. And then uh, sort of uh, the guy in the blue plaid shirt, that's the mayor of Battle Lake, Chuck Reeve. Uh, and then to the right of him is Steve, the public works guy. And then to the right of him is John, who owns one of the major businesses in downtown Battle Lake and has been a great supporter of uh, Complete Streets. So this group met uh, regularly uh, between the adoption of the Complete Streets policy and October of 2011 to come up with a concept plan to, uh, for the city council to officially submit to MnDOT District 4 for what they'd like to see the new Highway 78 look like. And, and but two things I should mention. Highway 78 is also known as Lake Avenue in Battle Lake, and it is the main drag. It is the, uh, the main street. And also, the lady in the black in the back there, uh, Reba, I, I should point out that about half the uh, content of this presentation was provided by Reba. Uh, Reba and I typically uh, present this together, um, so I want to give her credit for a lot of uh, what I'm showing you this morning. So the task force came up with a concept plan, and we had an open house on the concept plan where people could look at it and talk about it. And that same evening, we had a city council meeting, and that was on October 25th, 2011. And the city council voted to officially uh, submit the concept plan to MnDOT District 4. The Complete Streets project took place over three blocks in downtown Battle Lake. So this is a sample 
of the concept plan for one of those three blocks, but the other two blocks are very similar. Um, and we proposed a four to three conversion. So Battle Lake previously had two lanes in each direction. We proposed changing that to one lane in each direction with a center turn lane that allowed us to widen the sidewalks, uh, put an accent strip or an amenity zone down the middle of each sidewalk, bump outs at the intersections, um, a lot of the classic things that are now associated with complete streets. Uh, for the amenity zone, that stripe in the middle of the sidewalk on each side, uh, we wanted to somehow visually differentiate that from the rest of the sidewalk. Initially, we thought maybe we would have blue colored concrete. Blue colored concrete turned out to be too expensive, so we ended up going with exposed aggregate, which is a fancy MnDOT term for cement with a bunch of little rocks. Uh, but it looks beautiful, and I'll show you some photos of that, um, and uh, you'll love it. The symbols in the middle of the amenity zone represent various things like benches, planter boxes, trees, bike racks, etc. cetera. Um, we did not intend the uh, precise location of these symbols to be taken literally. We weren't saying to District 4 that's exactly where we want the bike rack or the planter box, but we just kind of scattered them throughout the development just to show where they could go. MnDOT District 4 was terrific to work with throughout this whole project. They were just fantastic. And they really did take our concept plan to heart. Uh, when they got the concept plan from us, uh, they hired Chris Cromie of Bolton Mank on the right there uh, to do the preliminary design. And this is not an advertisement for Bolton Mank. There are lots of good engineering firms all over the state and planning firms all over the state. I'm just mentioning that that's who they happened to hire. Uh, and Bolton Mank and Chris Cromie did a terrific job. So MnDOT hosted an open house on the entire Highway 78 project because the Highway 78 project remained a resurfacing for the portions north and south of uh, Battle Lake City Limits. So they had an open house on the entire project on June 19, 2012 at Battle Lake City Hall. Uh, most people in the audience, though, were from Battle Lake. That was certainly the aspect of the project that was getting the most attention and was the most interesting. So I sat in the front row. Um, Chris Cromie gave a PowerPoint presentation. And I sat in the front row taking photos of his slides. And so these are some of the photos of the slides. I'm not going to read through this, but um, he gave sort of the basic justification for the Complete Streets Project, what we were trying to achieve. Uh, he did a terrific job with that. We also had display boards around the room, and so I took pictures of those. So this is an example of the preliminary design, and then I also have another image of this. Um, so you can see here, and the numbers may be a little bit hard to read, but uh, Chris Cromie and Bolton Mank and District 4 really put the meat on the bones. They stuck to the original spirit and intent of our concept plan. So it really does match our concept plan really well. It's much more detailed, but they do show the two traffic lanes, the center turn lane, the parking lanes, the wider sidewalks, the amenity zone or the accent strip, the bump outs, uh, and of course, uh, ADA compliance with the truncated domes and the sloped curbs and all of that good stuff. So uh, it was a terrific uh, preliminary design. Here is an elevation. One of the advantages that Battle Lake has is we have 100 feet of right-of-way uh, on Highway 78, which is huge. Uh, just by contrast, there's another city in Ottertail County called Pelican Rapids, which also has a state trunk highway going through it. it happens to be Highway 59, and they only have 60 feet of right-of-way. So 100 feet of right-of-way is enormous. That gives us all kinds of room to do almost anything we want. Uh, this is the geometry that we finally landed on with the Complete Streets pro Project. And I want to point out that um, I've presented this geometry to a lot of different audiences, including some uh, very, uh, I would say, militantly pro-Complete Streets audiences. Um, you may or may not fall into that category. But uh, it's interesting because uh, when I when I present this to audiences that are um, especially pro-complete streets, uh, they have accused me of, even after this project, being ridiculously generous to the cars. And our friends from Hennepin County showed a, an elevation or some geometry earlier this morning 
showing much narrower lanes. Uh, they showed a uh, three-lane arrangement where the parking lanes were actually, actually seven feet wide. And the, the design that our Hennepin County friends showed us was actually asymmetrical. Uh, the sidewalks were not the same width on both sides. And even the driving lanes were not the same width on both sides. But the whole geometry was much more generous to the cars. Of course, in that geometry, they only had 66 feet of right-of-way. Here we have 100. But I recognize, I acknowledge that those parking lanes could have been 8 feet, those through lanes could have been 11 feet, and the center turn lane could have been 12 feet, and it all would have still met standards and it would have been fine. Um, and we probably could have even squeezed uh, bike lanes in there if we had uh, had the political will to do so. I just want to point out that this geometry, as it is, uh, got adopted by the City Council on a four-to-one vote. Um, I think that this is as aggressive as Battle Lake was politically capable of in 2011. It was a substantial improvement over the status quo, and I'm very proud of what we did. So the City Council did approve the, this plan. Uh, statutorily, in order for MnDOT to be able to do this complete streets project, the city had to adopt what is known as a municipal resolution of consent. And the city council did adopt that on September 25th, 2012. And so immediately after the city council meeting, I made a point of getting my photo taken with the plan and, and the mayor. So there we are. Even after the city adopted the plan, there are a lot of details that have to be worked out. Um, and MnDOT and Bolton Mank were great in working out these details. This was an ADA project. There were a lot of ADA improvements as part of this plan. I happened to be at City Hall on this day when there was a conference call going on between City Hall staff and Bolton Mank about how to make it easier for people in wheelchairs to get into the Baptist church. That alone was a two-hour conversation. They came up with a wonderful wheelchair ramp with a really cool railing, and it's just great. Um, but it's just an example of the kind of details that have to go in to the plan, even when everybody agrees on the basic framework. So the Highway 78 Complete Streets project, the actual construction, began late summer 2013. Uh, Battle Lake has a very tourism-dependent economy. And MnDOT District 4, to their credit, waited until as late as possible in 2013 to begin construction out of respect to the tourist season. They actually began after Labor Day. Now, the price they paid for that, and they knew that this would happen, is they ran out of good weather in November and December. And so some aspects of the project had to wait until spring 2014. They knew that would happen, but uh, they wanted to give Battle Lake as much of a normal tourist season as possible. I frequently visited Battle Lake. I live in Fergus Falls. I frequently visited Battle Lake while the construction project was happening to take photos of the process. Um, this is one of my favorite photos because I think of this as both a before and after photo combined. All of this is new concrete. But if you imagine the sidewalk there right up against Falls Baking Company, um, that sidewalk, uh, the old sidewalk, was about that size, although it did also include the light post. The light post location did not change. All the light posts went right back where they were. Uh, but So imagine that sidewalk uh, two or three feet wider to include that light post. That was the width of the original sidewalk. And you can see the curb outline of the new sidewalk. So you can see that we made the sidewalk wider, and you can also see that we put bump outs at the intersections. Now, making walking and biking safer and more comfortable in the community uh, through Complete Streets, that's what I like to call Complete Streets 1.0. But in Battle Lake, we added the aesthetic dimension. Uh, we made it beautiful, and that's what I call Complete Streets 2.0. So uh, we got a legacy grant. You may remember the legacy amendment that was adopted in 2008. That, uh, so we had a uh, legacy grant to add a public art dimension to our Complete Streets project. So uh, here, these are slides that were prepared by Reba, and she's just talking about some of the, the assets that we have in Battle Lake, natural resources being one of them. 
Another one in regards to the project was readiness, that we were ready to uh, seize the opportunity presented by this Legacy Arts Grant. We had a lot of collaborative partners that helped us with this Legacy Arts Grant. Uh, Lake Region Arts Council was the agency that uh, awarded us the grant. They are entrusted with legacy grant funds for our part of Minnesota. Uh, we had volunteers help uh, make the art, and we had two local artists, Annette Hochstein and Paula Boyum, uh, make the art. And don't worry, I'm gonna, I'm going to show you the art, but this is the this is the build up to it. All right. So <clears throat> what happened was we uh, partnership for health also became a financial contributor. Uh, one of the things that we did with the public art, we made mosaics for the new downtown Battle Lake, and Annette is holding a sample of that mosaic, but we also had artistic bike racks, and Partnership for Health contributed toward the cost for the bike racks. So first we had some meetings about creating the mosaics, and the mosaics went on benches and planter boxes, and, and it all looks marvelous, and I'll show you that in a moment. But we had, we relied heavily on volunteer labor for uh, the public art. And we needed a lot of people to help us uh, make this. And so this was an initial meeting with people in the community that were interested in helping out. We created a total of 20 mosaic panels. It took eight and a half months of work, three sessions per week, three hour sessions. 133 people worked on the mosaics for a total of 1,971 person hours of volunteer labor to make the mosaics and the benches. Here are some photos of a mosaic making session. Uh, there's my lovely wife Akiko on the right there. Uh, we also hired Paul Boyum, a uh, local metalworking artist, to make artistic bike racks. Uh, we had four bike racks. This one is the family bike rack, and so we visited Paul Boyum's workshop uh, when he ha was working on the bike rack. Uh, here are uh, three of the bike racks um, after they have been powder coated. We powder coated them a great uh, kind of copper metallic kind of co color. It's just marvelous. That color is sort of both metallic and organic at the same time. And then here is the construction process for the actual concrete benches and planter boxes. Um, we had three guys making the molds for the concrete benches and planter boxes and then also pouring the concrete for them. And these guys uh, worked really hard. It's just a huge amount of labor that they put into it. And, uh, and the thing about these, these are truly original benches and planter boxes. We didn't, they didn't just have to make them. We had to invent them. Uh, and involved a lot of compound angles, and the math got tricky, and, but, but they turned out marvelous. So we had a grand opening for, and a ribbon cutting for both the Complete Streets Project and the Public Art Project on June 7th, 2014. Uh, we had a, a number of dignitaries, in, including uh, our local uh, state senators and representatives. Uh, in the bottom left there, you can see the mayor cutting the ribbon. Um, and because Partnership for Health was a financial contributor to the project and also I contributed a substantial number of hours in the whole planning and design process for both the Complete Streets and the Public Art, I got to sit on the trailer with other uh, guests of honor, so that was uh, a big honor for me. And then on the right there, that is the Battle Lake Art Advisory Committee, which oversaw the public art aspect of the project, and I'm also a member of that, and we had a, our picture taken with one of the benches, so that's cool. Uh, we had a lot of fun that day. Um, in addition to the ribbon cutting, uh, we had a lot of different games and activities for all ages. One thing we asked people to do was guess how many pieces of glass are in that mosaic that you see in that photo. And so there's, there's a lady submitting her guess. Uh, whoever got the closest won something. I don't remember what they won anymore. But, it, but it's, uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, some of the people involved in the public art aspect of it uh, got selected as Grand Marshals for the parade on July 26, 2014 through downtown Battle Lake. I wasn't able to attend that day, but uh, Annette Hochstein is in the uh, passenger side front seat there in the car. Reba Gillian, uh, chair of the Art Advisory Committee, is in the back. Uh, Jonathan Hartman is also in the back, and I'm embarrassed to say I don't know who the driver is. And I, 
maybe I know who that person is, but I can't recognize them. But uh, this was a great parade. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to be there. But what was really interesting is that um, as the months rolled by, we were discovering more and more benefits of this Complete Streets project. And one thing that people told me after the parade was that this 4 to 3 conversion works out great for the parade because all the parade vehicles can go right down the center turn lane. And the audience has more sidewalk to sit on to watch the parade. The only uh, element of the parade that apparently did not like the new wider sidewalks and the narrower uh, lanes, or the, the, the reduction in the number of lanes, the, the narrower driving surface, shall we say, the only uh, person in the parade that didn't like the new Complete Streets project for parade purposes was the Shriner guy in his miniature car because he likes to do loops and he didn't have enough room to do loops, or at least he couldn't do as big a loop as he used to do. Okay, so now we have beautiful downtown with wide sidewalks. We have benches, planners, artistic bike racks, public art that attracts people to our town. People enjoy walking and biking. We have the Glendalow Trail, which is a 12-mile bike trail that connects uh, Glendalow State Park to Battle Lake, and all of you should go bike on that next summer. And we also got a Safe Routes to School grant, so we're actually going to be adding even more sidewalks and a multi-use path segment uh, next year, summer of 2015, which I don't have time to talk about. But uh, it's going to be awesome. So visit Battle Lake and enjoy Battle Lake and Glendalow and bring your bike and do it in the summer of 2015. So the community loves our benches. Uh, we have planners with original metal sculptures in the middle of the planners. So our, our metalwork artist, Paul Boyum, did these sculptures in addition to the bike racks. Here's one of our bike racks downtown in the middle of the exposed aggregate amenity zone. And uh, this one looks like uh, corn. Here's another one of our bike racks. This is the family bike rack at the... Lakes Area Community Center in Battle Lake, which is also the trailhead for the Glendalow Trail between Glendalow State Park and Battle Lake. Here is a before and after, although it's not the exact same angle, but it is the same location uh, of before and after of the amenity zone. Um, one of the things that did not get finished in the fall of 2013 was the amenity zone. All winter long, we ended up with these big rectangular dirt holes in the middle of the sidewalks. And of course, when they get covered with snow, they become tripping hazards. So to make it safe, District 4 filled them with sand. So those rectangular holes on the left, imagine those filled with sand. When District 4 did that, the mayor joked that we were going to import 400 cats downtown and that those were giant litter boxes. So I showed you the before picture, this picture earlier in my presentation. So I am about to show you the after picture. So here we go. Ta-da! I'm going to do that one more time. There's your before. There's your after. Thank you. Uh, th and thank you to the city of Battle Lake. They have just been fantastic to work with. And Wayne Hurley of West Central Initiative and I gave this presentation at the MNAPA conference in Duluth on October 3rd. We are trying to strengthen the marriage between public health and planning, and then eventually we're going to get the engineers in there, so we want to make it a three-way marriage. Uh, you're welcome to contact me for more information. Thank you so much, Patrick. We are, we are the Statewide Health Improvement Program. Thank you. Patrick? Yes? Can you go back a couple slides? Is that a picture of you holding the um, picture? Is that you in the blue? Yes, and uh, the guy on the left is the mayor, and the three ladies on the right there are City Hall staff, and everybody has just been terrific. That is awesome. Well, thank you so much. It's really great. It's seldom that we can um, have awesome, um, not that there aren't awesome like Greater Minnesota stories, but it's hard at these workshops in the Twin Cities to have uh, Greater Minnesota examples, so thank you for webbing in um, and the technology to make all this happen. So that here in the Twin Cities and across the state, folks can hear different kinds of projects. And it's not just happening in South Minneapolis or Edina. Um, it's happening in a lot of places. And I think that's important for people to understand, because that I don't think um, is always kind of understood that you know, communities in greater Minnesota can take these on as well. Yep, and thank you. I appreciate that. And you know, Battle Lake is only eight, 875 people. 
So nobody in Minnesota has an excuse that they're too small to do this type of stuff. I love it. Um, any questions for Patrick? Hey, Nadine. Did you find that it was easy to get volunteers to work on this project? Or did it, you have a lot of recruitment? Uh, there was a lot of, it, it took a lot of work to get those 133 people, but uh, there were a lot of people in the community that, um, uh, that were excited about helping with the mosaics. And I think that the public art element, and here's, here's a tip for all of you, is I think the, the public art element, not only was that very exciting for the community in and of itself, but in sort of a retroactive way, I think it built even more support, uh, perhaps even after the fact, for the Complete Streets project itself. Because people first fell in love with the public art. I mean, that is more exciting than you know wider sidewalks and bump outs. Uh, and and four to three conversions. People first fell in love with the public art, but then it dawned on people, well, geez, if we hadn't widened the sidewalks, we wouldn't have had the substrate or the stage for, for all this public art. And so, gee, it's a, boy, it's sure a good thing that we widened the sidewalks, otherwise we wouldn't have room for all this groovy public art. So I think the public art, from a public relations point of view, actually helps build support for wider sidewalks and road diets and complete streets. That would be terrific. You know, I uh, have laptop, we'll travel. I love telling the Battle Lake story. Um, and I'm an ambassador for Partnership for Health and everything we're doing. I didn't know you traveled. You could have come down here. Yeah. <laughs> My parents live in Roseville, so it's easy for me to come down there. Right. Okay. Others? So, uh, yeah, I just had a comment. Hi, Patrick. It's film music. Um, uh, well, one thing I was going to say is that this is a beautiful example um, of how you're adding such value to the, the street and the right way and and actually the evidence is that, especially with mature street trees, that uh, retail sales per square foot in areas that have mature street trees and have better sidewalks, um, you know, the data is quite clear from around the country that this is an economic, so, so you could totally spin this as a get people out and act as moving to public health, you could spin it as a, as a sort of business development retail health project, you can uh, <clears throat> spin it as a safety project, which is a cross I mean, there are many, that's the beauty uh, evidence here. So that's fantastic. But I had a specific question. What, were there issues initially, concerns from like truckers and farmers and long haul, you know, people who would use this short stretch of the state highway going through that? Like, were there concerns that even you know, this is going to make it sort of difficult? You're making it harder for me to do my business of cruising through town? Uh, we did get concerns about. Uh, oversized vehicles. In fact, uh, I'm, I switched to a uh, photo of the of the preliminary design. Um, we did get concerns about oversized vehicles uh, through the uh, design process. Uh, you know, Battle Lake is a rural community. There are a lot of agricultural vehicles that go through downtown. Um, somebody who objected to this project uh, claimed that if we followed through on this design, that when he brought his uh, agricultural machine, whatever it is, before it helped us a lot to get through that issue, the fire department, not the fire chief, but somebody else on the fire department about can fire trucks get around the corners with the bump outs, it was determined that they could. Um, so yes, there were concerns about oversized vehicles. And I think that any anywhere in outstate Minnesota where you've got communities in the middle of agricultural areas, uh, and you start trying to do these types of complete streets projects where you're widening the sidewalks and adding bump outs, uh, you're going to get uh, the ag sector and maybe to a certain degree the commercial trucking sector and possibly even your own fire chief or your, your own fire department are uh, going to start raising questions about can I get my vehicle through there either, either straight through or around a corner. And uh, you may very well have to get your city engineer or your consultant or ask MnDOT uh, to have their consultant 
uh, draw all the diagrams with the truck turning radii, et cetera, uh, just to show everybody that it's going to be okay. Other questions? Um, we have one last presentation that we either can do or we can skip because I, we, we kind of have a little more discussion, I think, than we thought. And um, Nadine is willing, there was a miscommunication, and Kelly Hammond is not here for Pennsylvania County, but Nadine can go through the bike plan if folks want to hear or see that. If not, I mean, we've had a really good conversation here. Um, I don't know that we need to do that. If there's other questions that we want to just wrap up, because we just have a few minutes left, we can just do that. What's the sense of the group here? Sorry, I have folks on the phone. I'm going to let the, the group in the room decide. If folks want to see the bike plan, the head of the bike plan, no, I'm yeah, sure. I head's shaking. Yeah, I know, because there's not that much time on. Um, but we can post it as part of the blog um, and you know share this as a resource out there for folks if they're interested in that. Again, another Hennepin County example. Maybe just a quick plug. Yeah, Google Hennepin County bike plan and then look at it. We're keeping public comments until December 5th. Yeah. Very different from what Hennepin County has done before. So yeah. take a look. And we'll, we'll, we'll tweet about it and share it and, and information so people can see it, too. Um, Terry. When you, you, I was interested in hearing it. Could you, could you just say, highlight, could you say something about it? You sort of kept it up there. <laughs> oh, there you go. Um, the, I guess the one thing I would highlight is that it's a vision um, in which bicyclists of all ages and abilities can ride their bikes for transportation and recreation in Hennepin County. So we're really emphasizing the 8 to 80 idea where if you design a facility for a child and for an 80 year old, then it's good for the rest of us. And we talk in the plan about protected bike lanes, about creating a network, of an, an enhanced bikeway network, which is comfortable for you know people who don't want to ride in traffic. So that's kind of, that's, that's the, the part that's the most different from what we've looked at before. All right, well, thank you all the presenters. Clap, clap, clap. Um, and thanks, Patrick, for phoning in. And I just a special thank you to Transit for Livable Communities for co-sponsoring this workshop and helping really um, give some good ideas about um, speakers and topics. Um, I think this is really um, good stuff, and we're excited about our um, webinar and the recording and that hopefully other people will come back, we'll promote it and get it out there so folks can come back and look at it and um, go through the slides. Um, I would like. Um, and XL Energy, our uh, theory sponsor, uh, thank you to them as well for working with us. Any last questions or comments from folks? Or I want to say anything from TLC? Um, well, uh, anything it's great, to, great to partner with the uh, Green Step Cities program. And uh, we hope that, uh, and this is a political plug, but uh, during the 2015 legislative session that uh, there probably will be a transportation bill that will be uh, discussed. And uh, we are really hoping that that bill will be a statewide bill that will be multimodal, all modes, including um, bicycle, pedestrian, transit, and then road and bridge repair. So uh, we encourage you to look into Move Minnesota, and uh, that's the name of the campaign, and I think it would really be a great step forward for projects like these on complete streets projects. So, thank you. Thank you. And one other plug for Edina with Ross Bitter being here. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, beyond looking at their citywide bike plan, uh, they also are doing sub-watershed analysis before doing residential street reconstruction so that they can figure out where to put the various BMPs for stormwater management. So. Uh, it's a super cutting edge approach and talk to Ross if, or maybe Ross might want to say a word or not, but it's great to work really in depth with the watershed district before you redo a residential area. Great. And that's Bob Terry, did you have something you want to add? Yeah, I just had a question for Barb um, about given the new legislature, where we are um, in terms of everything we've just been talking about. And let me just be clear, Green Set City does not advocate for any policy at the Capitol, so there's Conversation is kind of off the record. <laughs> Folks can have this conversation, but Green Tech City doesn't technically work on policy. So, is this a big policy? I mean, I think we've seen across the country that um, questions of infrastructure investment have been um, uh, bipartisan. And so, our hope is that uh, any changes we've seen in the legislation will, in fact, um, you know, the interest in uh, communities and elected officials in moving forward some kind of um, transportation agenda uh, in 2015. Okay. 
Um, much like uh, that Council is working on the regional bicycling corridors, uh, and, and uh, Nadine and DJ from um, uh, Hennepin County were talking about the uh, advantages of working peer-to-peer -peer with cities. Uh, not all of the cities participating in this uh, discussion are in Hennepin County, and so uh, count, work, counties working peer-to-peer -peer is something that I think is missing in this discussion and would be valuable for all of us because there's vastly different uh, places or, or points that uh, the counties are approaching this, and especially in the urban counties, uh, getting everybody on board a little bit more with with peer-to-peer -peer county uh, work, I think, would be valuable. That's great, thank you. And also, I was tweeting during the, the workshop, people probably saw or noticed, I did see that um, uh, Susan Hagrid had uh, resigned. I didn't even know that from that council. Oh. So, um, interesting twist on transit in the metro, for sure. Um, but, you know, more to be seen, I guess. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Stay warm. Thank you for folks on the phone and being involved online. We appreciate it. Um, we will send a survey out to all folks that were online or in the room. And uh, next up, uh, December 17th, I believe, 